So I'll take you into, uh, into the meadows. I'm, as I say, I'm always out and about as much as I can be. And a couple of weeks ago, there were some really big spring tides. So I headed up to Sturt in, uh, near Bridgewater in Somerset and uh, looking really for the waders. But there's also in this area, there's a huge area of sort of meadow type grassland or salt marsh, upper salt marsh grassland. <laughs> And on, if, for those who know Sturt or don't know Sturt, it's, um, it's a, basically a big area of grassland and they've uh, taken down part of the sea wall so it allows a huge amount of water to flood this area on very big tides. And if you've got a big tide like this, this area is usually completely, uh, uh, completely dry. This is just about an hour or so after high tide, but during, at that peak of high tide, there was a huge amount of water came up. It was very early in the morning and I headed down along the sea wall and all this grass on here never usually gets covered, but um, it was a fantastic waders. They're a brilliant place for watching waders and peregrines. But one thing that was you, you get a nice little surprise, and this was the whoops, this was the surprise thing I saw, was as the waders were swirling around, the peregrines were chasing. As the water level came up, all these voles which live in the grass <laughs> suddenly found themselves <laughs> flooded out, and they all started swimming to the shore. They're pretty good swimmers, actually. These are all field voles. There are a few shrews as well. <laughs> they come trundling along. <laughs> yeah, there were absolutely dozens, dozens, dozens of the things coming in, so I could line up on one of them and got that one coming in at my feet. And as well as that, there were thousands of little flies and spiders and things like that. And all these creatures, because you look at meadows in the winter and you think, well, there's nothing there really. But actually, a lot of the insects are there. They're all hidden away in grass tussocks. And only when you get a, a, you know, a shot like that, a big flood, which is obviously only happens on these sort of habitats, so very few times in the year. But suddenly, all these, all these little tiny insects come to the surface. And you see there the voles covered in flies. And there's absolutely thousands of little flies and spiders all living in, the, in that meadow habitat during the winter. This is a, a local meadow uh, verge site in uh, Buckfastley. I work with the local uh, Buckfastley Action for Nature group, which Tracy is a, a leading uh, participant of. And uh, we, we've taken over control of the verges, all the road verges around Buckfastley. So now we manage them for wildlife, so which is great. So this is us uh, out. We usually have one day during the winter when we go out and clear particularly this, this particular verge, you clear back some of the brambles and open up the grassland. And it's really, just in a couple of years, it's made a fantastic difference to the amount of flowers there. We have, a, of course, a special plant in Buckfastley, um, which you can see in the winter. You see these rosettes of green leaves here, which is, this is the Deptford Pink. And the largest colony in the UK is in Buckfastley. So there's many, many hundreds of plants here. Uh, beautiful little flower. It flowers in sort of, July time is the peak time to see it, late June, July, if you want to see this plant. Um, and it's very common along all the verges around Buckfastley, uh, the Deptford Pink. It's even got its own signboard now. There's a few <laughs> little signs about it, so it's, a, you know, it's of national importance. <coughs> and this is uh, a page from the, the Atlas of, uh, Devon, of Devon Flora, which is a great big chunky book. I think you can now get it online and it's a really, really useful resource for anyone interested in meadows and flowers. Um, it's got lots and lots of historic as well as current information on all the flowering plants which occur in the county. And of course we've got a fantastic county to live in. It's, such a, it's a big county, obviously Devon, and it's, but it's also got such a varied geology that there's all sorts of different habitats from up on the moors to the coastal habitats, which I'm going to talk about today, um, and the, in the southern Devon, and there's obviously the warm areas in South Devon, the cold areas up on the north coast, sand dunes, and a whole variety of habitats. So we're very fortunate to live here. And of course, the soil is uh, the most important part of any meadow. It's often sort of slightly forgotten because a lot of the, the soil is the living structure, which obviously all the, all the plants grow in. Um, and there are some really lovely books which are done by a guy called Tim Harold, which actually uh, have a, an atlas of all the soil types on very, very detailed. And this was uh, one he sent me about the soils just around Morton Hampstead. So there's a whole series of these, these books. And I think they're fairly limited edition, but they must be available in libraries somewhere if you want to find out a bit more detail about where you live. Obviously, the soil 
in itself is not one of my specialist subjects, but it is a, a, is a living, soil is an absolute living creature, really. It's uh, full of tiny little you know, bacteria, viruses, tiny little creatures, microscopic creatures, but it is you know, the living substrate in which all the, the, the meadow plants grow in. And that little page was taken from a book which I always keep referring to. It's one of the first books I was given when I was a child, the AA Book of the Countryside. And it's, uh, you can still get hold of it now, but it's a fantastic resource of all sorts of information on all sorts of British wildlife. So down, as you get into the, uh, the sort of, down in the undergrowth really, at the, at the roots of the, uh, the grasses in, and plants in the meadows, there are some slightly bigger creatures which you can actually see with naked eye. And the smallest amongst these, I suppose, are the springtails. And uh, these are, can be very abundant in the, in the leaf litter. There can be you know, hundreds of them in a square meter. And there are predators of these creatures. So if you get down in your hands and knees, uh, having a root around in that, in that leaf litter, if you take a white tray actually and just pick up some leaf litter and put it in the white tray or sieve it through a sieve, it's amazing what you can find hiding in there. And this is one of them. This is a, a thing called Notiophilus, and it's a springtail hunter has giant eyes, so it enables it to creep through the undergrowth and spot a springtail and jump on it. And there's uh, obviously a lot of springtails, so there are a lot of hunters which go after them. Uh, this is another one called Lorisera, and this one has these big spikes on its antennae, and when it finds a springtail, it grabs it with, it, with its curls, its antennae around and grabs the springtail in, in amongst those spikes. It makes like a cage and then munches the springtail. And as well as tiny invertebrates, there are lots of fungi so these are a selection of wax caps these were i sketched these up at deer park farm which is on the edge of dartmoor the east side of dartmoor uh, near chudley and uh, fantastic areas and if you have these old grasslands you uh, particularly very late in the year sort of october right through to november you find these fantastic displays of wax caps growing in there, which are a, a feature of ancient grasslands so they're really nice if you have a a grass and with these wax caps in, you're very lucky. And some of them can be quite beautiful. There's some, there's some the normal sort of red orange ones, and there's these beautiful big ballerina wax caps as well, which you occasionally find. Sometimes you find these sort of fungi. This is a, a fairly common grass and fungus. It's a little red spike. It doesn't really look much, but it's a very interesting fungus. It's actually a, a, um, a predator of caterpillars. So the spores of this fungus lie in the, in the sort of ground level, of, uh, level of, the, uh, of, the ha of the grasslands. And when a caterpillar, which is feeding on the roots of the grasses, comes into contact with this the spore, uh, the spores in, in invade its body and take over its body. And then the fungus grows. That's the remains of the caterpillar there. You can see it there. It comes as like a zombie caterpillar with this huge uh, fruiting body of the uh, scarlet caterpillar fungus growing out of it down in the soil, that sort of in the roots, you get a lot of uh, cockchafer larvae, um, which are, you know, feed on the, they're often regarded as a pest, but you know, I think they're, they're good things to have around. And uh, they obviously turn into these uh, cockchafers and summer chafers as well, which we'll see around midsummer. And these are really important food for creatures like bats. I mean, the greater horseshoe bats, which uh, we have really good populations of, some of the best in the country in, in South Devon, uh, the females of the greater horseshoe bats rely on these, this glut of food in May when they're pregnant and uh, to, to feed up and, and nourish themselves while, they, while they've got young and then they give birth to the young a little bit later in the year. So really, really important uh, food resource and one that's declined enormously across the country. I, mean, I remember I, when I was a child in the 70s, these things were abundant everywhere. Uh, whereas now, you know, certain areas like Dartmoor, you still get good numbers of them, but across the countryside in general, their numbers have, have declined enormously, which has led to, you know, uh, reduced numbers of, of species like this bat. So obviously in South Devon, we have relatively undisturbed areas on Dartmoor on the south coast and in between, and hopefully more areas which we've been hearing about uh, just now where people have been turning the, these, meadow, these grasslands into really nice flower meadows and supporting a lot more insects, so a lot more bats and birds and, 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 and as well as invertebrates will live in them. Not all of them are out in the day, some are out at night, so going out at night with a torch in the, in the meadows and grasslands, you'll find all sorts of other creatures. 
This is a, a violet uh, ground beetle. And this one will feed on slugs, so a good thing to have around uh, in your meadows and gardens. And things like barn owls, of course. We saw pictures of barn owls just now. So if you've got these grass and habitats, lots of voles, you'll, uh, if you're lucky, you'll get barn owls moving in. You can put nest boxes up for them, or if you've got some old barns in the area, they uh, will come in and nest. And they used to be abundant in the South Hams. You know, many, many years ago, there would have been hundreds of barn owls, and now they obviously decline. But they're still here, so there's still potential to uh, bring back their numbers to their, their former glory. And they're feeding on small voles. It's a bank vole. So as well as the meadows, you've got all the hedges and related to the meadows, which are just as important habitats. So it's having that combination of meadows, woodlands, and uh, hedgerows, which uh, provide the real uh, vibrant, you know, huge amounts of wildlife uh, able to live and also able to move around between the habitats, which is a, an important thing. And harvest mice as well, which aren't particularly uncommon. They're quite tricky things to see. Um, this one was while I was coming into a, a trap, which was, uh, well, not a trap, but a little feeding station where they were coming in to feed. And, uh, but it's easier to find the nests, particularly in the winter months, you can find the nests in tussocks. And there is a uh, the Devon harvest mouse group, which you can go out. They go out on trips during the winter, actually searching for harvest mice. So uh, well worth a trip out with them. It's another one of our greens. This is our verges in Buckfast Lee. So a very, it previously was just cut by the council once a year and everything was left, as you saw earlier. You know, if you just leave the, the cuttings there, it all just rots down and actually makes a better soil and the grass gets back even taller the year after. So you really have got to cut and collect it. So that's what we've been doing at, uh, with, the, with our local group. We've been cutting it and collecting the grass, taking that away, also putting down some wildflower seeds, some green hay, and trying, and it's already made an improvement. All it, already within a couple of years, we've got it's changed from being a what was a huge area of grass to actually having quite a few wildflowers coming in there. It takes a while to do it, so we still get a few, you know, complaints in the summer. <laughs> that, what a mess that is! But you know, we kind of I, I actually neatened up the edge of it, so it made it look a bit neater and cut a path through it, but. Uh, it will, take, it will take several years, but we will get there in the end. And uh, with a bit of yellow rattle always helps and uh, a variety of wildflowers. It will become a beautiful, a beautiful bit of grass and full of insects uh, as well. And so we do have some, obviously, some signs there just to educate people about why is this a mess, you know, because the people want to come and <laughs> cut it down. So it's, a, it's a much about an education or process as well. And as you heard earlier, we're using yellow rattle there which you collect seeds from various donor sites uh, which you can collect in July. I use a sweet net which I'll show you in a little while and uh, to collect the seeds up and then uh, spread them out. You can spread them out when you've collected them or during the winter if you've or the autumn when you've scarified the soil. Then the seeds of the yellow rattle are a bit like little solar panels. They sit on bare ground and then they'll germinate usually about the end of February or, or this time of year February, March, they'll just start, they need a bit of bare ground so they can warm up and then they'll germinate and then grow into the, into the plants. And as the plants grow, they'll latch onto the roots of grasses and then suck out the, the nutrients from the grasses. So, you know, dampen those down and let the wildflowers grow in between. And allow things like these butterflies, we have lovely colonies of marble white butterflies around the verges. And these actually feed on grasses, but they do need the flowers as well to feed on. So just a, a, you know, a, a monoculture of grass is, is no good for them. Uh, they need to have a mixture of grasses, so a lovely hay meadow full of, full of different flowers and uh, lots of different insects and different flowers and, and grasses for them to feed on. This is an unusual little meadow. This is at Traeger Mills. Um, and if you're there in, in about June time, uh, there's a, a bank there. It's just where you collect the sort of oversized garden um, stuff from the, if you bought any big sacks of whatever for stones and things from the garden centre, where you park there. If you go across on the bank, there's thousands of uh, bee orchids which grow there. Uh, really a fantastic. It's the best display I've ever seen, actually. Um, it, the whole bank is just covered in literally about 1,000 bee orchids there. So if you're at Trago's in June, have a check that out. <laughs> This is a bit closer to home. I did a survey for Anne at uh, Mothercombe in last summer, 
and some lovely meadows there. I'm sure many of you will know these meadows. Uh, as well as below, they have the formal gardens, but below that have some lovely meadows. And these are full of birds that trefoil. And so I use my sweet net, and this is a, a sweet net, as for those who don't know, is a stout net, like a bit like on a handle, just like a butterfly net, but it's made out of canvas, and you just you can uh, just move it through the low vegetation, and it catches any insects, dislodges them from the vegetation. And it's amazing what you catch. You, know, you may not see anything there, but this is oh, that was just a short sweep through the meadow there, and it's absolutely thousands of little bugs. These are true bugs, little uh, grass bugs and other myriad bugs, lots of beetles and flies and all sorts of things, which you just can't see. But uh, using this method enables you to actually get a window into how many invertebrates are living in some of these grasslands and the warmer they are so if you've got you know if you're using yellow rattle it's not shaded out the ground isn't shaded out there's lots of flowers a good diversity of plants and then there will be a huge diversity of insects things like click beetles lots of different flies all sorts of things snipe flies and soldier flies and hover flies and lots of butterflies as well so uh, we heard earlier about leaving patches of grassland in the winter. This is really important. So if you do, if you cut a meadow, it's always a good idea to leave some sections uncut each winter. And you can change them around over the years, so move them as long as there's a section uncut uh, in any one winter. Uh, this enables uh, caterpillars of the brown butterflies, the meadow brown and the small skipper. The caterpillars of these butterflies will actually overwinter as caterpillars and they will feed you in the winter. So if you cut the meadow right down, there's nothing for them to feed on and you might actually destroy the caterpillars in the process. But if you leave some section, then there will always be enough habitat for, for a certain proportion of the caterpillars to survive in. And that's an example at, uh, at Yelmpton, actually, where we cut the meadow there at Stray Park and then uh, just left some strips around the edges. It doesn't have to be much, but it just makes the difference between cutting it everything, you destroy all of the creatures that live in there. But if you just leave little bits, there's enough as a reservoir, and they soon bounce back and, uh, and recolonize the cut areas the following <coughs> year. And you'll get a lot of insects. So this is at, back at Mothercombe. There's lots of little mining bees there on that bird's foot trefoil. For certain flowers are really good, so things like bird's foot trefoil is, is a classic one for for small bees. Uh, in the UK, we have about 280 species of bee. Um, there's about 25 bumblebees, the honey bee, but all the rest are solitary bees. And these are largely unknown. Um, and they really are quite beautiful little bees, and, but they're quite unobtrusive things as well. So if you grow certain flowers like the, the bird's foot trefoil and go and have a close look at them in the summer, then you'll see these tiny bees at work. So this is a, a Wilkes mining bee. And this one specializes in clovers and, of, and that family. So clovers and trefoils, it really loves. It only goes to, to collect food from those flowers. So a lot of these solitary bees, unlike the bumblebees and the honeybee, they f only fly for a short period of the year. So there's a lot of species which emerge in the next few weeks, which uh, rely on all the spring flowers and the spring blossom. And then there's other species which fly at various points during the summer which uh, some of them are very specialists, just go on one particular flower, um, but others feed on a range of, say, clovers and vetches, but they just fly for a few weeks each year. And these, as their name suggests, are mining bees, so they're actually nesting underground. <laughs> um, you may never see the actual bees, because they're, they're quite elusive, unless you have to look really closely, but you may see their cuckoos. Uh, so this is a thing which looks a bit like a wasp, and you may see these buzzing around your lawn or the meadow, like a tiny little centimetre long wasp and it's slowly flying around. And this is a cuckoo bee. It's actually a bee and it's, um, it's a, so it doesn't make its own nest. It, in, it finds the, a host bee nest, in this case the mine, a mining bee, and then goes into the nest and then it will lay its egg in, inside the nest. And the larva of this bee will eat the larva of the, the host bee and it will all its food as well. So uh, <laughs> this, this happens quite a bit. So it's a sort of way of cheating, I suppose. It's... Uh, Rather than collect all that pollen and stuff yourself, why not just wait for another bee to do it and then just jump in there and, uh, and steal it? And this happens even with bumblebees. You know, not all bumblebees are friendly and furry things. There's a whole bunch of bumblebees which are coming out now, and they will, the big queens you see, they will start their nests and set them up. And then in about April, there's these sort of criminal bumblebees, the cuckoo bumblebees, and they, they lay in bed till late. They get up in late <laughs> April, have a snooze. They're not bothered about getting up early. 
and then they'd come out, fly around, find a nest that's set up, kill the queen, and then use all the workers to raise another brood of cuckoo bees. So this has been going on for millions of years, and so they all sort of get on together uh, just about the, uh, the, the, all the bees survive anyway. It's not in the, in the cuckoo's um, you know, benefit to actually uh, destroy its host. So when you've got meadows like this, it's important, if you're attracting things like bees, uh, it's important to have areas where they can nest. So it's the, the largest concentration of bees I found at Mothercombe was just by this bank, and it's a south-facing bank, so it's well-drained, and that's a, a, a particularly good place for the bees to nest in. And they do need these areas to nest in. That's just as important as the flowers. So having a nice south-facing bank, well-drained, the bees are in there, and then they only go as far as they have to. So if there's a nice patch of flowers there, they'll just go and feed there and then nest. So you get a bigger concentration near the nesting site. Also, in the, uh, there was a barn there with some bits of actually rotting wood along the edge of it. And uh, in this, there were tiny little sort of woodworm holes, and there were some absolutely minuscule bees. I mean, our bees vary from the big, you know, buff-tailed bumblebees, you see the big queens at this time of year. It's tiny little bees, which are like the size of a mosquito, really. They're just a few millimetres long. And this is one of them. This is uh, a little uh, species which feeds on bell flowers. So it's absolutely minuscule. There it is. There's a bell. It, love, it only specialises in bell flowers. So if you grow bell flowers in your garden, this little thing called Chelostoma, a scissor bee, will come in and visit it. And things like dandelions, of course, important. This is on our verge in Butfarsley, where we've, we've left the, the verge to grow up. You get a lot of dandelions and cuckoo flower and things like that appearing. And dandelions are a real um, excellent source of nectar and pollen for the spring flying bees. And as I said, they need these, these areas. So bare ground is a really important habitat, which is often not often thought about. It's the places, having little patches of bare ground, it's not only sites where the bees can nest, but it's also places they can warm up. But as you know, you know, spring almost came a few weeks ago and then you get a spell like this during the spring and you know, it can warm up again and then go cold again. And these bees and other insects are out and about, but they do need to warm up. So having a patch of bare ground in a nice little sheltered spot will enable them when they wake up in the morning, even on a cold day, they can go and sit there, warm up, and then they're warm enough to get going and collect the pollen and, uh, and start nesting. So they're very important areas. So if you have any opportunities to create bare ground in, on, in your meadows, that's, and particularly if they're south facing, they'll be very good for, for nesting bees. And even you know, piles of sand and, and gravel. So this is a, just where a place I was working in Plymouth, and it's where the council had got their sand or whatever, and they just dumped it there. And, they, and there were a whole load of ivy bees nesting in, in that pile of sand. So if you've got access to some sand, just put some piles of sand out somewhere. And the, uh, any, any, anything that's well drained will, uh, will attract the mining bees. In our garden, I put sand out in the flower beds. I just put sand, just drop bags of sand literally in the winter and it just washes in. And since then, we've had a lot of mining bees coming into nest. Uh, again, you don't often see them, but you do see things like oil beetles, which are another parasite of the cuckoo of the, of the bees, which I'll talk about in the second half. Another thing you could do is uh, make cob walls. Uh, if you, and this isn't such a cob area of the country, but around Exeter is. Uh, there's a lot of lovely old cob walls there. And this particular one's at Alfington Church in, uh, on the outskirts of Exeter. And if you go there any time from now uh, on a warm sunny day, you see hundreds of bees there uh, nesting. And so I took some uh, inspiration from that and made some cob bricks and put them out in our garden. And we've attracted hairy-footed flower bees to nest in our garden. I mean, they're a fairly common bee anyway, but if you give, they really love old cob walls. So creating your own cob uh, will, uh, will at attract them in. They overwinter as adult bees. These are our earliest flying solitary bees. So they, the first one I saw this year is about the middle of February. So they'll come out as soon as it's warm. And the reason they do that is because they're overwintered as an adult bee uh, inside, the, inside a cell, inside the cob wall in this case. And so they sat there. They emerge as a bee in September, but they just sit there ready for the first warm days of spring. And then they're out and flying around and they're ready to go immediately as it gets warm. 
uh, quite a common bee. They, um, the male is, is buffy coloured and the female is black with orange legs. If you grow pulmonaria in your garden, the lungwort, this bees absolutely love that. So uh, grow some of that stuff if you want to see them. Now meadows can be any size really. So you, can, if you may have a small patch in your garden. You may have a large field as we saw earlier. Um, so, but any size is, is good for, for wildlife. And in our garden, this is in Butfordsley, we live in a 1970s housing estate. And this is probably the smallest meadow that you can get. If you look just between the fence and the road, there's about four or five, you know, 10 centimetres of soil. Um, but uh, we put the fence in and, and I just let that grow. And that's an amazing meadow in the summer. It's really warm as well because it's got the tarmac underneath. And it, it, it's just a, a, a flush of flowers during the meadow. And it's a, a meadow from nothing, really. Um, we obviously stop it going too far out in the road, and I just cut it back once a year. And then it all comes back, and so it's a, a nice bit of habitat which you can create from almost nothing. This is a, a field actually in the South Hams, and this is a, a field which has been abandoned. So you've got a lot of tussocks of grass growing, and you've got some uh, uh, brambles encroaching on here. And this is the sort of place that a uh, very special bird which lives in South Devon, the Searle Bunting, uh, will really love. So it, it feeds the, uh, it will start nesting in the springtime and it really likes to feed on grasshoppers. It feeds its young on grasshoppers in the summer. So old abandoned meadows like this are really important for them. And, it, and it's a success story really in conservation. It was almost extinct in the UK, but then it bounced back and now it's spreading right across the South Hams and even onto the southern edges of Dartmoor now and around Exeter to spreading north. It doesn't fly very far. It's one of those birds that, you know, it's a bit of a stay-at-home bird, so it only moves very slowly, but it is gradually building up and, and colonising across south, southern, uh, southern Devon. And that's the male cell bunting, which is a bit easier to identify. The female looks a bit like a yellow hammer, but I thought I'd put the female in because you don't usually see the female. People always show pictures of the male. And as I said, they like to feed on grasshoppers. So having meadows with it, uh, really good populations of grasshoppers are great for, for this bird. Uh, grasshoppers, a bit about their life history. So grasshoppers lay their eggs in the ground, female laying her eggs in the summer. And so the, gr the eggs are in the soil. And then those eggs will hatch in the spring in sort of April time as tiny little miniature versions of the adults. And then they'll grow over the period of the, over the summer until about June, July time when they're full grown. And then they will breed then. And then the, all the adult grasshoppers will die off by the end of the summer. So they shed their skin several times as they grow. And then by late summer you get uh, the adult grasshoppers. So these are, there's two really common species of grasshopper in the UK. Uh, so grasshoppers, although they're all multicoloured, they are actually quite easy to identify. There's the meadow grasshopper, which doesn't have wings longer than its body, and the females particularly have very short wings. So they can't really, once they've gone from the meadow, unless there's an adjacent, adjacent meadow, it's very difficult for them to recolonise. So I have been um, planting some on some of our verges around Butfordsley last year to see an experiment to see if we can get them back. And uh, there's another, oh, that's a harvestman with a grasshopper head. It was eating a scavenging <laughs> one. Let's put that one in there. Um, so they, and, they, and the other common grasshopper is the field grasshopper, which is the one that flies. If you're wandering along through the grasses, grasshoppers fly up. And so they're a lot more mobile, and they will move into, into grasslands a bit more, uh, more quite quickly compared to the meadow grasshopper. And then as well as grasshoppers, there are bush crickets. So grasshoppers have antennae, which are shorter than their bodies, little stubby antennae. All bush crickets have long, slender antennae. And we're lucky in South Devon to have big populations of this, uh, one of our largest insects, the great green bush cricket. And this one, the female lays her eggs in the soil, and then the tiny little uh, crickets emerge in April time, and then they grow during the summer until about July when they're full grown. And then you can hear them rattling away in the undergrowth in hedges often by the edges of meadows in the summer. And then they, the adults die off by late autumn. So that's a sort of half-grown one. Um, if all the young ones have wings which are shorter than their body and they're actually turned inside out. So it's when, the, when if they've got wings which are turned inside out, they're not quite adult, even though it's quite a big chunky insect at this stage. Having plants like hogweeds around the, the edges of the meadows are really good because they're good for you know, insects which feed on them. There's some little micro moths, the uh, caterpillars and things like that. And you'll find the great green bush cricket wandering around. 
because it's predatory, so it will eat, it will eat um, vegetation, but it's much more likely to eat other insects, caterpillars and the like. And also in the dead stems of the hogweed, you'll get things like earwigs that live there. And earwigs are very good predators of uh, lots of things like aphids. They're very good to have on fruit trees, for instance, um, but also they're abundant in, me in meadows, feeding on uh, all sorts of tiny little creatures. And uh, the, they're, they're nice. One of the things that's probably not well known about earwigs, they're very good mothers. So the earwigs at this time of year are underground and they, they lay their eggs in the autumn and they guard them right through the winter until they, the little baby earwigs hatch. And then they, as they, after the earwigs have hatched, then they, uh, the little ones have, the mother dies and leaving the young ones to, to wander off and fend for themselves. And it's good habitat, edge habitat for birds, like white throats, which like to nest on the edges of meadows where there's lots of uh, sort of thick nettles and brambles for them to nest in. These are migrants from Africa, so they return in about the middle of April and have two broods during the summer. And they like, to, they like places where there are nettles and hogweeds and lots of insects just adjacent to the hedges. So they like, like living in the edges of meadows. And these sort of nettles, of course, will attract caterpillars. So these are peacock butterfly caterpillars, which like nettles, particularly those growing in sunny situations. And small tortoiseshells as well and red admirals, all these vanessid butterflies, uh, quite a few of them feed on nettles particularly. And other species which feed along the hedgerows, uh, plants such as uh, garlic mustard. This is the, just see there's some tiny little orange eggs on there, which are the eggs of the orange tip butterfly, which flies in the spring. So having these along the edges of meadows in hedgerows are really good for populations of this butterfly. It spends most of the year as a chrysalis, like this, looking like a thorn, just stuck in. So it's, it's like in this form from June right through until April. So it has to avoid detection by birds and mammals all through that time. So it just looks like a thorn, just stuck in a hedge somewhere. And then in April time, the, the new butterflies hatch. It's a female, and there's the male just hatched out, just expanding his wings. And that's a real sign of spring is here, really, when the orange tips start flying along the lanes. Really beautiful little butterflies to see. And that's a mating pair of orange tips. And one of the butterflies you that you get in the, uh, in the meadows, particularly where you get plants like bird's foot trefoil. If you can get this plant back, you'll get the common blue, which uh, is not really as common as its name suggests. But in the past, there were, you know, I know people in their 80s who've uh, come and had spoken to me about when they were ch children, they used to see literally thousands of these in the meadows. And now you, you, you'll see a few, it's fairly common, but there's nowhere near that abundance of them now. Um, so it's hard to imagine seeing that many of these butterflies. But if you grow some birds for trefoil, even in a small garden, this, this butterfly will find it and come in and breed. OK, well, I, I've mentioned bees quite a lot in the talk because obviously bees are really important uh, part of the uh, invertebrate community in, in meadows. Um, there's a really good book on bees, which was written by a friend of mine, Stephen Falk, a few years ago, which covers all the British bees. And he has a, a, a Flickr site as well on, online, which has pictures of every single bee and every variety of each individual bee, uh, if you're interested in, in finding about, not necessarily identifying them, but just looking at the diversity of the bees in this country. Uh, they are quite tricky things to identify uh, generally, but there are a few species within the 280 which, we are, which occur in the UK, which are relatively easy to identify. So some of the bumblebees, and some of the solitary bees as well. So this is one of the, the common uh, mining bees which comes out in the spring, the orange-tailed mining bee. And it has a little orange tail, the female, and a sort of foxy red thorax. And that's a very common one. It loves dandelions in the springtime. Uh, the grey mining bee, which is, a, again, immediately distinctive bee, which is another spring-flying species. And this is grey with a lovely sort of blue-black body and a black band across its thorax. So that one's instantly identifiable, uh, as is this one, which is uh, uh, Andrina fulva. I've forgotten its English name at the moment. The tawny mining bee, it's called. And that one's a beautiful bee. And that one, is, again, is another spring-flying bee. Um, a lot of the bees, these are females. Um, the males look almost identical. So it's actually with these mining bees, you identify the females. But they're more likely what, what you're going to see. Um, the females of these bees collect the pollen on their hind legs. So they'll go to the various flowers and collect pollen on their hind legs, a bit like a, a honeybee would. 
Um, but other bees in different families collect their pollen on the underside of their abdomen. So this is a leaf cutter bee, and she has her pollen collecting hairs on the underside of her body. So you can see she's got a load of pollen, and she can collect quite a good amount of pollen just on the underside of her body. So the, they vary between the, the different types of, of, of solitary bee, how they collect their, their food. Not all not, bees aren't the only pollinator, so all sorts of other creatures pollinate as well. So a lot of flies do, and also unusual ones like beetles. This is some broad-leaved helleborines, uh, actually at Brook Wood near, near where I live on Butfast Lee, and they were being pollinated by these um, black-tipped soldier beetles, which you, which are very common on the hogweed in the summer, um, and they were going to the orchid. Now orchids have uh, their pollen in little sacs called pollinia. And you can see this beetle here has these stuck on the back of it. So it goes into a flower. The pollinia stick onto the beetle and then it sticks its head in the flower. And then when it goes to another flower, that, that, the pollen is rubbed onto the flower and then pollinates another flower. So uh, this would happen with a bee and in this case uh, a beetle. So all sorts of other insects are, <coughs> are really good for pollinating too. And as I said, many of them are, are cuckoos. And one of the really interesting groups of cuckoos, of, of, of mining bees, is the, are the oil beetles, which are starting to emerge at this time of year. This is a, vi uh, a black oil beetle, this one, which is the one, there's two common oil beetles. One which you tend to get more on Dartmoor, which is the violet oil beetle, and another which you get, which is very common along the south coast. So if you're wandering along the coast path, you'll often encounter these big fat beetles, and they'll be black oil beetles. Uh, they both have a similar life history. Um, they're called oil beetles because they produce oil from their knee joints. Um, and this is, this is quite toxic and nice foul tasting, so birds will leave them alone. Um, and this is why they just walk brazenly out in the open. Uh, the females of oil beetles, they're really big fat. You see these enormous, great lumbering beetles in the, in the uh, late spring, wandering across paths. And they can lay up to 40,000 eggs, each, each one. And this is because they have such a risky life history. So the eggs of this is, the, in this case, the violet oil beetle eggs, uh, when they hatch into tiny little larvae called triungulins, because they have three hooks on each foot, and they swarm onto flowers. And these are about two and a half millimetres long. So they're the largest of the oil beetle triangulins in this country. And what they do is they wait on flowers and the reason there needs to be so many of them is because their life history is to, to attach themselves to any insect which visit the flower. They hitch a ride on that insect and then get taken off somewhere else. Um, so they may just disperse around the countryside using this method. Um, or they may, if they're lucky, end up on the back of a solitary bee. And then they get taken back to the nest, jump off. Um, the bee will know they're on them, so the bee will try and get them off anyway. So they have to hide on the bee somehow and then get into the nest and then they'll feed on the pollen which the bee has collected for a, a, her own young and then the oil beetle will develop underground in the nest. So there's a lot of things, this is maybe why these solitary bees are so elusive because there's a lot of things after them, not just cuckoo bees and oil beetles, there's bee flies which I no doubt many of you will see in the springtime, these rather friendly looking furry little flies with a long tongue and each one of those has developed inside a, a bee larva so this one, the bee flies, they will lay their eggs, they will um, flick them around into bare ground. The tiny little larvae will crawl out and go into the bee burrows and they will find a bee larva. They'll wait by it and wait for it to become full grown. And when it's full grown, they suck all its insides out <laughs> and turn into a pupa and then hatch as a bee fly. So bees have to be, solitary bees have to be incredibly industrious just to stay one step ahead of all these parasites which are after them. So the oil beetles, the, the two common ones emerge in the spring and they mate this time of year. And the females will lay their eggs underground, as I showed you just now. So this is a, a violet oil beetle eggs. And they hatch as tiny larvae. Um, the, in the case of the violet oil beetle, they hatch as tiny larvae in the autumn. And these will emerge uh, onto the flowers in the springtime. And then the same uh, onto the bee, as I showed you earlier. Um, the, in this country, we have two common species, but we have five altogether. So, and they're all. And Devon is the hot spot. In fact, South Devon is the best place in the country for oil beetles because we get all five of these. Uh, well, not all five of them. We get we get four of the five species occurring here. So we get the the violet oil beetle and the black oil beetle, which are the most tricky to tell apart, which is a pity because they're the commonest. 
and then we get the short necked oil beetle, which is only known from a handful of sites, and one of them is down at Bulbury Down, um, but maybe occurs at other sites as well around South Devon. Uh, the rugged oil beetle, which is confined to calcareous chalk grassland, so it doesn't occur in this part of the world. Um, and the Mediterranean oil beetle, which is a very rare beetle, um, which is found again along the south coast of Devon and a few sites in East Sussex. So the short necked oil beetle. Is, uh, was thought to be extinct, and then it was found, refound in um, on Bulbury Down a few years ago now, and so it's currently known just from a handful of sites in England and Wales, up into Scotland, and a few sites just in uh, England and, and Wales. So it's a very rare beetle indeed, but there's a, a really nice colony of them down at Bulbury, and it could well be in other sites because it's quite elusive little creature. So uh, it'd be nice if any if anyone. Yeah, there's a guide. The guide to oil beetles I showed you is available online. It's also on my website, which I'll give you details at the end of the talk. So if you are interested in oil beetles and, have, and examine them closely, if you find one with short, straight antennae, it will very likely be this short-necked oil beetle, which would be very exciting. And uh, also another one with straight antennae uh, is the Mediterranean oil beetle. And this is unusual because it's unlike the other oil beetles. It, it comes out in the winter. And so it's active at night as well. So it emerges in September time. And then it's mainly active up till Christmas on mild nights. Um, it comes out after dark. So it uh, sort of eludes um, people finding it, really. And that's probably why it hadn't been seen for, for many years until uh, I found it down at Bulbury Down a few years ago. And as I said, these are the, these are the violet oil beetle larvae. And they're quite big compared to the others. So the larvae, the violet oil beetle, about two and a half millimetres long. The black oil beetle, the other one that's common on the coast, is about one and a half millimetres long. But once you get to the rarer species, the larvae are tiny, you know, sort of half a millimetre long. Um, but there usually are lots where they occur, so, but you do have to search quite, quite uh, deeply into the flowers to have a look to find these things. And as well as oil beetles going after the bees, there are various flies. It's amazing that any of these bees survive. And there's these little um, leucophora flies, and these flies will um, follow bees back to their nest, and then they'll go in there, lay their eggs on the, on the food, and then the maggots of the fly will eat all the food. Earwigs will go into nests and feed on all the content. So bees really do have to work hard to outwit all these things. And that's another one of the uh, cuckoo bees, as I said, which look more like small wasps than a bee. And these are common in some of the, the grasses. This is um, lovely bluebell meadow. So this is a really good sort of place where you find it's south-facing, well-drained. There's a lot of ground-nesting bees there, uh, but, which you don't often see, but you do see the oil beetles and the bee flies there in abundance. So if you see those creatures, you know that there are a good population, or there must be a good population of solitary bees, even though you may never see the bees themselves. In the damper parts of the meadows is a, a mint beetle, feeds on to the water mint, which grows in the, in the wetter parts of the meadow. And uh, that site is also a, a good spot for small coppers, which is one of, the, one of the beautiful little butterflies which we get in this country, which flies right from the end of March right through until October in about three broods. And these are stunning little things. And they, the caterpillars will feed on sorrels and docks. So they like sorrel and they like docks as well. And other creatures will eat docks. So it's always, you know, you may spend some time trying to eradicate docks. But some docks, having some docks is good in, in a meadow because they're good for things like dock beetles, uh, which can be abundant you know, on docks. And they provide food for birds like the white throat and other birds as well, as well as other invertebrates. And also these damper meadows, you may be lucky to get some of these impressive crane flies, our largest crane fly, the giant crane fly, which has beautifully marked wings. And these fly in the summer uh, in, the, in the larvae feed and leather, leather jackets feed in the damp mud. And uh, a little bit about willows. So obviously the areas adjacent to meadows are very important. And willows are one of the one of the key species of, of shrub, really, which is for, for insects, particularly bumblebees and other spring flying insects, because they start flowering now. So when these things come out of hibernation or they emerge early in the year, uh, this is a real essential food source for them. So if you want to know which species of bumblebee are in your area, on, go out on a nice warm day in the sort of end of March, April time and find a willow tree in flower. And you'll see all the queen bumblebees will go there and feed. So you work out which ones are around 
and you can often get dozens of them. In this case, tree bumblebees and some bufftail bumblebees or white-tailed bumblebees. Those, those bees will emerge and then seek out this food source. Not the cuckoo bees, of course, they'll still be asleep waiting <laughs> for later in the spring. And as well as that, you get things which look like bees, which aren't. These are a couple of hoverflies. There's a drone fly there and another hoverfly which mimic bees. Um, that is a bee. That's a, a thing called Andrina clarkella, which is a, a specialist bee, which only flies very early in the spring because the females only collect uh, pollen from willow trees. So if you have willow trees in a nice patch of well-drained ground, you may well get these, these bees moving in. And good for birds as well, things like uh, so the chiff chaff. They will come in and feed on the insects which are attracted to the, uh, the willows. Certain plants, if you have them in your meadow, will attract certain insects. So they said certain things are specialists. So one of them particularly is the chimney sweeper moth, which feeds on pig nut. So if you have pig nut in your meadows, and there are, and also there needs to be populations of these insects nearby, uh, they will move in and uh, colonize the, the site because they, they only feed on pig nut. The females will lay their eggs. They just drop their eggs onto the ground. The females fly in June. Uh, the males and females fly then, they mate, and then they, because the pig nut disappears as a plant in the winter, the eggs are just literally dropped onto the ground, and then the tiny caterpillars emerge in the spring and find the new shoots of the pig nut and then feed on those, and then they're full grown, sort of in late May, they feed on the flowers and the, and the developing seeds of the pig nut. And in similar areas, you get this moth, the mother Shipton, which is named after uh, ancient w witch, I think from Yorkshire. And you can see it has a witch's head on each, on each wing with a hooked nose and a hooked chin, you can make out there. That's the mother Shipton moth. And this is more of a, a specialist moth of Dartmoor. So this is uh, the narrow-bordered beehawk moth. So not one you're likely to get in this part of the world, but uh, one which occurs in some of the damper meadows on Dartmoor. And this is a specialist on devil's bit scabious. So it absolutely loves it. Um, and it, and it, the caterpillars only feed on devil's bit scabious. You see the big hawk moth caterpillar with the spike on the end feeding on the devil's bit scabious and then the, the moths, which do look just like a bumblebee, fly in the springtime. And as well as these, all sorts of other insects and predators in the, in the undergrowth because it is a jungle out there and there's all these insects, invertebrates and all sorts of predators, herbivores and, and carnivores. This is a, a flower spider which just lurks on flowers for waiting for passing insects to come in to feed and then grabs them. And it obviously has a super toxic venom because it can just kill them almost instantly. Um, bigger um, insect uh, spiders like the wasp spider, which you may well get in this part of the world. They're spread, they first uh, came across the channel in, in Sussex and then they spread along the south coast. And they really are quite big, impressive spiders. They like to catch grasshoppers. So they spin webs low down in the grass and then they'll catch grasshoppers um, blundering into the web. And then these spiders will build a, a beautiful egg cocoon in late summer, and then the egg cocoon will remain in, in suspended in the vegetation. So it's another reason for leaving parts of the meadow uncut, because if you cut all of it, you'll cut all, destroy all the eggs of species like this, of the, of the wasp spider. But if you leave a few areas, then there'll always be a few egg cocoons which will survive, and from that, they can repopulate the meadow. Um, one thing you will get in this part of the world is our largest fl true fly, the hornet robber fly. And this is about two, three centimeters long. It's quite an impressive thing and it mimics a hornet, makes a buzzing sound, but it's completely harmless to us. Uh, it hunts for, it's an ambush predator, so it hunts for other flying insects, uh, which come into often onto bits of dung and uh, pro or in prominent spots it lurks on a molehill say and then when something flies by it flies up and catches it it has big bristly legs for catching their prey this is one which is called a, a rove beetle and basically it's got a big tongue and it just sucks all the insides out of its prey <laughs> poor thing still alive and sucked up this one got disturbed by an ant <laughs> and, and that's our biggest fly, but it, it's, although flies are very well studied, we have the Devon Fly Group in Devon, which uh, we have some very distinguished uh, dipterists in there. But the, the larva of the hornet robber fly, which must be giant, has never been seen in this country. It's only been seen a handful of times anywhere, but it must be an enormous thing. 
and it's thought to feed on the larvae of dung beetles. So where you've got uh, populations of, uh, of dung beetles which are feeding on dung, where, particularly where the livestock hasn't been treated with any pesticides, um, you will get good populations of dung beetles, and then you get the hornet robber fly moving in, obviously to feed on the probably to feed on the larvae of this. And the hornet robber flies are doing really well along the south coast. Places like Sawmill Cove is a good spot for them. So they are in the area. So if you've got suitable uh, potential habitat for them, they're very likely to spread. A few of the other insects is talking about their life history. So this is a, a shield bug. Now a bug is a general term for use for insects, but there are true bugs. So this is a true bug, but it is a bug. It has a, a Bugs, the definition of bugs is they have straws instead of jaws, so they suck either insides of plants out, sap, or they suck the insides of in other insects out. And bugs uh, start off like the grasshoppers and crickets. Uh, they don't have a full metamorphosis like a butterfly. They start off as a miniature version of the adult and just grow bigger during the summer. So that's some baby shield bugs, and then they'll grow through the summer until they're full grown. And then most of the bugs hibernate as adult uh, bugs. And the green shield bug, I'm no doubt you're familiar with, the green bugs, you often see them in gardens. They actually turn brown in the winter for, for camouflage amongst the dead leaves, and then they turn back green again in the spring. This is uh, what looks a bit like an overgrown ladybird larva, and this is uh, the larva of the glowworm, which is, again, quite common along the south coast. I found them at Mothercombe when I was working there. Uh, particularly on the coast path, but they also will venture inland as well. And they feed on snails, so the larvae feed for about two years, and they, they, they find snails, inject them with some digestive juices, and then suck out all the inside of the snail. And then, uh, then after a couple of years, they grow into an adult uh, glowworm. Uh, glowworms aren't worms, they're beetles. So this is a male glowworm, and he does look like a, a normal, fairly normal beetle. The female looks more like a sort of uh, like a ladybird larva or, or something like that, really segmented, not really like a typical beetle. Um, so that's that's the larva, and that's the that's the male glowworm, and he has giant eyes. So he has huge eyes. You see under his carapace there, and his one mission because they don't feed as adults glowworms, they just live for a week or so, and so the male's only mission is to find the glow of the female. So he'll uh, start flying at dusk, which in midsummer is quite late. Um, so I did a glowworm walk. I'm doing another one this year for Life on the Edge. Uh, we're going down near um, Solcombe to look for them, Bolt Head. Um, but you have to get out, you have to go out very late because last time I did one, it, it was actually so clear that it didn't get dark. So we, <laughs> even by the end of the walk, it wasn't dark. So we ha but hopefully, if it's cloudy this year, we we'll hopefully see them. Um, so the females emerge, switch their light on, and then attract the male in. You can see that light with his big eyes, and he'll come in and mate with her. And then after mating, the female will lay her eggs in the soil, and then she will die after a week or so. They don't feed as an adult, and then the new eggs will develop into glowworm larvae and feed up over the next two years. Some of the coastal grasslands, this is at Bolt Head. Uh, home to all sorts of interesting insects because they've been largely undisturbed uh, for, for many hundreds of years. So there's all sorts of unusual things which live there. It used to be a site for the large blue butterfly, but sadly disappeared now, uh, probably through slight changes in management of the habitat. Um, but the ant, which the large blue is dependent on the ant, and if you watch Wild Isles, you'll, um, if you don't know about the large blue, there's a lovely sequence in, in Wild Isles in the Grassland episode about the large blue butterfly. But it relies on this ant, uh, Myrmica savuleti, um, which uh, the caterpillar of the large blue goes in inside the ant nest and lives in there. One of the butterflies which occurs on the, on, in these coastal grasslands is the grayling. Uh, this, uh, like the other brown butterflies I showed you earlier, uh, overwinters as a caterpillar. And their caterpillars are nocturnal, so to find them, you have to go out at night. Uh, the butterflies fly from sort of late June, July time into August. Um, so the caterpillars are full grown about the end of May. If you go out at night with a torch, you can find them coming out and feeding on the grasses. And then the butterflies are incredibly well camouflaged, really stunning camouflage. They feed on sort of, um, they like bare bits of ground, sand dunes, or bits of uh, heathery sort of areas um, and other dry grasslands. But yeah, they're absolutely stunning bit of camouflage from the grayling. 
and so they'll be flying yeah usually July and August time is the best time to see those though obviously there have been a huge decline in the numbers of invertebrates particularly in the last 50 years and this is flying across Devon this is actually out near Honiton but if you fly over the landscape you can see that you know 100 years ago these were all been flower meadows and and that's why you know these people you know older generations say you know there were thousands of common blues and you can if you look at that with a bit of imagination you think well if there was if that was all flower meadows how many butterflies would there have been there would have been absolutely millions um, so largely through improvement through agriculture that's why that's why these meadows have disappeared and we've lost a few species we used to have this this bee, the great yellow bumblebee, used to be reasonably common in Devon, but to find it now, you've got to go right up into the Outer Hebrides, where the Macare grasslands is still uh, a, there's still abundant enough flowers to to support this really big. It's a great big, huge bumblebee, which needs a lot of flowers, and it's not that mobile. So um, you can see how through destruction of meadows, it would have quickly disappeared and become fragmented populations, and then died out altogether. But we do have some special bees in, in Devon. One of them lives at Slapton Lee, and this one feeds on hemlock water dropwort, which grows in the damp meadows. And it's a specialist of this, like, like many of the solitary bees, this one will only collect food from hemlock water dropwort. So it's the hemlock water dropwort mining bee, uh, called Andrina Ampla. <laughs> and uh, it has a little, a little nesting colony. It's not far from Slapton Lee uh, Centre. Uh, just along, there's a little footpath there, and they, they nest in the banks there. So you can see them at certain times. You usually end in May, early June, but they don't fly for very long in the year, a week or two, and then the, their season is over. And they have a cuckoo as well, which is quite a rare cuckoo bee, called Nomada conjungans, and it's, that's, the, that's the host bee and its cuckoo bee sat next to it. So you wouldn't really believe that that top one was a bee, but it is, it's a bee, it's a... I suppose it, it pretends to be a wasp. It's, it does, it's not flying around collecting pollen. It's uh, ha hanging around nests of these, these host bees. And uh, just end with one of our most special bees, which is one of my favorite bees. Uh, occurs just around a few, in a few spots around the south coast of Devon. And this is the longhorn bee. And this one loves to have, uh, it loves to feed on clovers and vetches. Um, everlasting pea is one of its favorite flowers. So it's, this is the male, and he has super long horns. He's the Life in the Edge uh, logo there, you can see. Uh, the female has much shorter antennae. I'm not sure why the males have such ridiculous antennae, but they, they do, and they are rather, rather spectacular. And they, they're, not, they're, like the, they're about the size of a small bumblebee, so they're not tiny little things like a lot of these solitary bees, so they're pretty easy to recognize. And if you're out along the coast path around between Prawl and Malcolm, that sort of area, sort of in June and July, you'll see these bees. They're reasonably common there. And it's the only site, the, so the, the only site in the UK where this bee lives. And this is the, the cuckoo of the longhorn bee, uh, which used to be fairly widespread across the UK. But as the populations of the longhorn bee have died out, then there's no, there's, a, there's only one really big population left, and that's in South Devon, which is able to support this, this cuckoo bee. So the six-banded nomad bee, it's called. And this is a, one of the UK's rarest bees. There's only a, only a few seen each year uh, just around the colonies of the longhorn bee. In typical, and the longhorn bee will nest in the soft rock cliffs around, uh, around Prawl. And, uh, and as Rob said earlier, these areas have been surveyed recently and they found the brown-banded carder bee, which also likes to like so in this case kidney vetch is one of its favorite flowers to feed on so and the, the, a lot of these bumblebees are quite tricky to id but um, the, there's a common carder bee which you'll get in your garden and, and looks very similar to this the brown banded carder bee is subtly different it has a little brown band you see on her body but um, they are quite tricky things to identify the longhorn bees are, are reasonably easy to identify even the females and if you look on the everlasting pea um, plants growing along the coast path there. There's some quite a lot around Malcolm House and sort of East Prawl. Um, you will see these bees because they absolutely love this plant. Um, and so you'll see the females collecting the pollen and then flying back to their nest sites, which are in the, in the sort of uh, vertical cliffs, the soft rock cliffs on the, uh, on the coast there. And I'll just end with a little video of the, 
the longhorn bees flying around, a bit of slow motion. These are the males. And that's the female. So she's collecting her pollen on her legs. <coughs> and she'll fly off to her burrow, and this is her nest site in the cliff. So she may go for a mile or two to collect pollen. Yeah, she had, it was a bit of a windy day that, and it was a bit of trouble nest <laughs> landing. Falling out. <laughs> she gets there in the end. <laughs> okay. Right, okay. If you'd like any more information on uh, the, what I do, have a look on my website, which is johnwalters.co.uk. Uh, Kate at the back there has asked me to mention I'm doing a talk at Yelmpton, I think at the end of April. But all information will be on my website. If you have a look under events, you can find any other talks I'm doing. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to mention, you want to yeah, get more slide out. I'm sure there must be some questions. <coughs> Any questions for John or Francis? Yes. Um, we've got about 11 beehives on a relatively small piece of land, about two and a quarter acres. Right. Would the presence of those 11 active beehives have any negative effects on the native in well, I'm sure it would. Yeah, it's never been proved, and obviously, bees, honey bees, are domesticated, and so having thousands of them, it must have some effect. But no one knows for certain uh, what that effect is. But there must be there must be some effect going on because you, you're introducing, you know, artificially. It's not natural. Fat. It's not natural no. So they and all these wild bees, as I say, they're quite elusive little things. So it's hard to sort of monitor and see, find them anyway. Um, whereas, so it, it's very difficult to get any data in, in, in to, to determine if, if it's having an effect on them or not. Um, you need to do quite a detailed study over a, over a long period of time. But honeybees are everywhere, is because they, you know, obviously they can um, move quite large distances. But they, w I'm sure that they must have an effect because just by the simple, you know, simple common sense of you know introducing all those those bees, yeah, there's a, it's going to make a difference. Yeah. Yes. Do the um, cuckoo bees not get predated on by the other bees who must be quite grumpy with them? Yeah, they're not, they're not happy about them. I mean, some of them, if they, uh, the leafcutter bee has a cuckoo bee, which is a, a sharp-tailed bee, and she has a sharp tail, and she goes into the leafcutter bee's nest, cuts a hole in her nest, and lays her egg. But she has to go into a crevice, and uh, she's, the cuckoo bees are quite armor-plated, if you look at them. Because they, that's because if they go in a hole and the host bee finds them, they'll attack them and, and try and sting them. So they, uh, yeah, they will, yeah, if they find one in their nest, they, they don't like it at all. They'll, they'll try and sting it and chase it off. And does that work? It must do because they, that's why they evolved these armor plated ah. things to, to, to deflect the sting. So it's a bit of an arms race between them. But yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah certainly leaf cutter bee, and most solitary bees, if you can pick them up, even the females, they won't sting you. Or they, they've got stings, but they won't hurt you. But the leaf cutter bees, they are one of the solitary bees that if you pick them up, they've got quite a nasty sting. And that's obviously because they've got these, these, these um, sharp tailed bees after them. And they need a more you know, venomous uh, sting to uh, to get rid of those. What, what's the favourite food of the leaf cutter? The leaf cutters feed on all sorts of things. A lot of them like thistles, but they'll feed on a whole variety. And there's there's several species of leaf cutter bee we get in this country. Decimated my bay tree. Yeah, they do love to uh, <laughs> chop all the bits. But uh, yeah, I like having leaf cutter bees around. Yeah. <laughs> if you watch Martin Dawn's film, there's um, my garden of a thousand bees, some lovely sequences there. And the, and the whole um, film is really about one bee, which he gets to know, uh, <laughs> which is, and gets to know him in a way. That's what makes it such a special film. But that's all, it's mainly about one, one, and it, one leaf cutter bee. I've got one more thing. Yeah. Um, do we have any pine processionary caterpillars down here in the southwest? No. You do get oak processionary caterpillars, I think, around London, but I've never seen them here. We do get lackey moth caterpillars, which you might see on the coast, which have a web, but they're quite, and you see the stripy caterpillars, they're quite common on the coast, but they're quite harmless. Um, but no, we don't get processionary caterpillars. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, the, 
it's it's really fantastic hearing the link between the plants and the insects. Yes. So many books are about identification of birds, identification of bees, yeah. of flowers. Can you recommend any books that are about ecology and about habitats that where, where we can learn, okay, that here's an orchid here and this is the insect rather yeah. than just that's a type Yeah, of there's not actually that many books. Uh, they're really quite specialist, actually, a lot of the books. You've got to go into that mm. rather than sort of general books and you've got to go a bit deeper. I mean, Dave Golson's books are good. If you get hold of some, yeah, Dave Golson, because he's really good. He's a, you know, he's a scientist who works yeah. on, particularly on bees, but he's very good at outreach work and writing in a way that um, uh, explains things. So I'd recommend Dave's mm. books, definitely. Yeah. Any other questions? That's fine. Yes. If, if you were preparing the ground for, uh, for a meadow, yes. um, you, you mentioned the, the shortcut and clearing yeah. um, uh, away the cuttings, but you also mentioned patches of bare ground. Yeah. Now, uh, how, how would you do that? With a strimmer or with a... Um, a scarifying. No, it's not because I don't have a meadow, but have you meadow... What, what would yeah. you use for, the, for doing mean, that? That's where some plants have an animal in there. So if you have things like cattle in there where you get bits, bits of poaching, where you get bits of rare ground. Um, mole hills. Oh, just mole yeah. hills. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Mole hills. yeah, mole hills are good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mole hills are great. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the size of the meadow. If it's a small patch, then you can get a rake and do it, but obviously if you've got a larger Would patch, you need to... A scarifier, yeah, yeah, yeah. Francis, how did you? Um, um, when we were doing it by hand, it was jolly hard work. I had a sharp three-pronged um, hoe, and it was just yanking it across the grass, and it was just really hard work. They used a power harrow. So uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that got through with no problems. <laughs> 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 so, yes, at the back. Is there any level of protection for bees and insects when it comes to things like planning and development? There's, it's very few insects are protected. I mean, it's, it's sad, really. There are very few that have actually got any legal protection. There's certain, there's certain species which are classified as nationally scarce and nationally rare so when i'm doing surveys of, of sites i can identify that there's if there's a large number of these special you know scarce species on a site that can go towards um, changes in the development plan or mitigation plans but there are very few species that are actually legally protected yeah. No, no. I mean, meadows, I suppose they were just common in the past. They, they, you know, they were so common that that's in a way why they've been destroyed because they were, they were just, well, it's just a meadow. There's thousands of those. And then piecemeal destruction and you know, mechanisation particularly. And suddenly they've all gone and people think, oh, where are these meadows? And yeah, things like that. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Are you hopeful with the change with, the, with farmers being encouraged to use less fertiliser? Do you think there's, I mean, we've said a lot of, yeah, you know, I yeah. what you're saying, but with the new changes with the RPA and yeah. the, the single farm payment scheme, do you think that's a hopeful? Well, hopefully, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's how it's. It, you know, so we're part <coughs> of that scheme, and I was just wondering, you know, with yeah. the, that, whether you're uh, feeling that that's a positive way forward. Well, hope, hopefully, yeah. I mean, it's obviously depends on the uptake of it and and actually putting it to practice. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I like to be optimistic. Yeah, Kevin. Oh, I had a, an email, you mentioned Dave Gawson, and yes. uh, in answer to the um, gentleman's question about honeybees, Dave said, uh, we know that more honeybees mean fewer wild pollinating insects by both competition and spread of disease. It is the wild bees that are declining. Honeybees are one of the most common insects on the planet and globally are not in decline. It's similar to proposing to encourage chickens in Devon woodlands as a way to save the birds. <laughs> but indeed, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty clear Ministry. that competition and disease spread from honeybees. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have honeybees, 
because they are domesticated and they provide honey, which we all like. Um, but I think it's about numbers rather mm. than uh, yeah. and, and, and density rather than um, thinking that honeybees are going to save all bees. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, John, first, thank you for your uh, okay, exercise. Thanks. Uh, really informative and uh, learned a lot personally. But um, as, uh, as a newcomer to this uh, discipline, yeah. um, as I would hopefully learn more about the insects that you've spoken about tonight, and the bees in particular, yes. is there a mechanism that you know, we as a community uh, can uh, report in a sort of a, a local consensus so that we can begin to understand the spread of these insects or is there some way the mechanism that we can report into a central you know, well you could there's a thing called i record online which you can photograph things and and post them on there and they can uh, they'll be identified by the people on there so that's a good that's a good sort of citizen science sort of way of of, of recording because there's a lot of things which you can um identify from photographs i it's called i record so you can join that um, post pictures on, show where they are, whatever, and uh, the data on them, and then experts in different groups will, will be assigned uh, the, the photographs and they will identify them for you. There's another one called iNaturalist, which is more sort of European uh, as well, and that's got some very good sort of AI things on there where you can post a picture and it will tell you uh, quite often, quite accurately, uh, what uh, certainly what group of insect it is, and sometimes it will it'll identify them as well. So it's a lot of this technology coming into play now. Um, it's but it's fast moving. <laughs> fast What's moving. Yeah. About I record as well is that those records eventually end up in the national kind of databases as well, so they then can be used yeah. to inform, you know, kind of state. Yeah, and they'll also end up in the Devon biodiversity, yeah. which is you know obviously a point of uh, contact for a lot of uh, people when they you know, go to the Devon Wildlife Trust and their database, the Devon Biodiversity Record Centre, uh, for you know, planning applications and all that sort of thing. So by recording nationally, these records will get fed back as well locally.